Hello, everyone. My name is Monica Kretschmer, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Universal Women's Network Woman of Inspiration Awards. And this is the Woman of Inspiration podcast, where we speak with women who lead, inspire, and motivate. These are women who are paving the path, ignoring the naysayers, and inspiring others to dream big. Now, with me today is a very special guest. She is a 100 Woman of Inspiration book contributor. She is also the vice president of Capital Markets for CIBC. So, Today, Victoria Nugan, oh gosh, I just I just did a little kerfuffle here. I'm going to start again. Nguyen, no, how am I not saying this correctly now? <laughs> Nguyen. <laughs> Nguyen, Nguyen, oh my God. Now I did this to myself. I'm, I'm going to not, I'm going to record that over again because I can. Um, so I'm going to pause. Hello, my name is Monica Kretschmer, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Universal Women's Network, Women of Inspiration Awards, and this is the Women of Inspiration podcast, where we speak with women who lead, inspire, and motivate. These are women who are paving the road less traveled, ignoring the naysayers, and inspiring others to dream big. Now, I have a very special guest on the show today. Um, she is the Vice President, uh, Capital Markets for CIBC. Uh, Victoria Nguyen is the 100 Woman of Inspiration book contributor. Of course, we have this amazing book featuring female leaders um, coming out this fall. And so Victoria, it is such uh, a pleasure to have you on the Woman of Inspiration podcast today. Welcome. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. It's very exciting. Well, I'm super excited because you have a, an amazing background story. You know, you're vice president of one of the largest banks, um, you know, with a, and I'm going to get to your career path, um, you know, for those listeners. Um, but where I'd love to start is every woman has a story. So Victoria, you are an immigrant, first generation immigrant to Canada. So would you like to share a little bit about um, the history um, with your family coming to Canada? Sure, for sure. So imagine close to 300 men, women, and children crammed together on the decks of a leaky 60-foot wooden boat. The local uh, fishing vessels were not equipped for long ocean voyages, and many have lost their lives drift on them. Like many newcomers to Canada, my family and I left a war-torn country in search for a better life. We escaped Vietnam under the darkness of night among the peak exodus of refugees known as the boat people. My mother left all her worldly possessions, family, and friends to brave the unknown. She, along with five children, my two brothers, um, the youngest being 18 months old at the time, my sister, myself, and her 14-year-old niece took to the seas in hopes of reaching the shores of Thailand uh, and from their sponsorship to America. As luck would have it, the motor died on the second day of our journey and we sprung a leak. Uh, what little food we had brought along with us was mostly stolen during the nights. And as days dragged on, drinking water became uh, you know, less available and, and had to be rationed. With every passing day, there was less hope of survival. On the sixth day, uh, drifting aimlessly, we were rescued by a French cargo ship and brought to a refugee camp on the Philippines. Eventually, we were sponsored to Canada by a small church group. I'm a first generation Vietnamese Canadian immigrant, uh, as you've mentioned, who grew up in a Dutch farming community located in Northern Alberta. Uh, I would spend my primary educational years with no one that looked like me. The Vietnamese culture was not well known back then, and aside from images and accounts of the horrific war, uh, kids would tease me for looking different, make fun of the foods I ate, my accent, and my struggles in learning a new culture. I was often mislabeled and at times referred to in derogatory terms and used for various Asian ethnicities. It would be years before my family moved to the city where there was more ethnic diversity. Throughout my life, I've always had a strong role model, my mother. She relentlessly impressed the importance of education and hard work. 
In her home country, she ran the family business in a male dominated industry, which was construction. Having come from a position of privilege and wealth in Vietnam to starting all over in a new country with literally nothing, my mother would always say, if you're gonna do something, do it better than those around you and start making your own luck. Mm. Well, making my own luck, as it were, came in forms of curiosity, being an avid learner, uh, confidence in my abilities and the courage to ask for what I wanted and the humility to learn from my failures. There was no task too small or insignificant for me to undertake. I loved working in teams and most of all, I thrived on succeeding where others had failed. Mm. So that's a bit of my background. That is quite a story. And I look at the resilience um, from such a young age of just witnessing your mom being such a strong female role model. I look and I'm, you know, hearing the words as your mom led a construction company. Yes. Right. We know today how the stats are for women in construction and they're, you know, I'd say, I don't have the numbers exactly in front of me, but in the low twenties, um, right. Women's voices and women, women in construction, but your mom, what a trailblazer. So you had such a great role model, um, growing up. Yes, definitely. So my grandmother, her mother before her, I think I come from a very long line of very strong women. So there's often that resiliency and, and that support in, in knowing that there are these challenges that we face out there as women, regardless of what industry or profession you choose. So how old were you when you came to Canada? So when we landed uh, in Canada, I was uh, around four years old. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how old I am now, but... Uh, <laughs> I was quite young and so fortunately being at that younger age I was able to make friends that uh, you know fortunately did not see color uh, and uh, was able to kind of uh, immerse myself in the Canadian culture. Hmm. And when did you start learning English? I mean was it you know were, were you quite young when you learned English? Did it come very naturally for you? Um, so I would say I started in kindergarten, so it was quite young. I remember the first few days just watching everyone and, and wondering, like, what it is that they're saying? I just kind of had to copy what they were doing, uh, not really understanding what was going on. And then eventually things just kind of clicked. So it uh, fortunately, learning a new language at a young age was uh, definitely advantageous. Uh, and uh, I was able to embrace that language with very little accent, uh, happy to say, but uh, it, it was a challenge. And today my mother still uses uh, us as her children uh, as interpreters for a lot of what she has to do uh, because English is hard to grasp. Mm, it is very hard to grasp. And so, you know, at 12 years old, you know, um, I, this is one of the questions I had for you is, you know, at 12 years old, um, did, what did you think you would be when you grew up? Did you think that you'd be a vice president of a bank? You know, um, what were your, do you remember, um, how that was when you were 12 years old? Yes. And I think for a lot of uh, Asian women or Asian audiences out there, it's fairly common. We grow up with the expectations of our parents. So at 12, I would say that I was expected to choose a profession in either uh, law, uh, finances or accounting uh, and or medicine. So those are like the three professions that uh, the Asian culture is most familiar with. So at 12, I decided that uh, I wasn't great at the numbers. And so I didn't think I was gonna go into accounting. Uh, I thought maybe I would go into law. I really enjoyed uh, languages. Um, I enjoyed conversing with others. And I thought, you know what? That may be a profession that I would be good at. But, uh, you know, fast forward, uh, I ended up uh, getting into engineering, which uh, wasn't any one of those three things that my mother had laid out for me. And so engineering is yet another male dominated industry where they're really welcoming women to come to the table and, 
you know, participate. So how did you make the transition from engineering and university to, to the banking world? What was that like? It doesn't kind of feel like a straight line to me. <laughs> No, so being a first generation immigrant, uh, I had to start working fairly early. So as I was going through school, I was also working, I had a full-time job all through high school uh, and into university as well. I chose engineering because it was uh, the program that would get me in, um, a degree fastest. So I figured four years of engineering, I would get a degree. I was working full time at the time and also helping my mother and her family business. Um, and as I was finishing off my degree, I had a full time job working at the local Canada Trust branch because of the hours that they had and they had uh, evenings and weekends. Um, and so I found that I was balancing both uh, school and uh, and work and then as soon as I was done uh, they offered me a full-time job and moved me to uh, Toronto uh, from Edmonton in order to pursue my banking career. And so did you have were you surrounded by you know champions mentors advisors within the banking industry from the get-go was there a path created for you from the onset what did that look like? I mean, how many years ago was that compared to where we are now with really a focus on women in leadership roles within industries? Yeah, I know for sure. I would say this is over 20, 25 years ago now when in banking, uh, the Asian strategy had just come out. It was this new concept where you know, localized branches would try to service the community uh, in the language in which they were comfortable um, with, uh, you know, employees that looked and liked them and understood their cultures. So that uh, helped me get that position in the bank. Uh, they wanted me because I could speak both English and Vietnamese. Although, you know, it was a challenge at times being different and with the Asian strategy, it was in its infancy. So there was a lot of support and advocacy from that perspective that helped me kind of grow into the role and quickly uh, transition into more progressively senior leadership roles. So let me ask you about your leadership roles. What would you say are your strengths in leader? And if somebody was to describe your leadership, Victoria, how would they describe it? So I would think for me, I identify with being a servant leader more than any other uh, leadership um, role. I would say that people feel that I am uh, quite demanding as a leader, but also extremely supportive in ensuring that the team is successful. Uh, I believe in teamwork. I believe that everyone contributes in a way that is beneficial for the uh, whole and not just for that individual. And so we really try to build a harmonious team, leveraging everyone's uh, core strengths in order to accomplish one end goal. So that's really important for me. Um, and I would say that folks find that I am uh, down to earth, uh, very um, you know, approachable and, uh, and uh, understanding. So your role as a vice president um, in capital markets is a big title. Um, you know, how do you promote and sort of encourage other women to sort of step up and take those opportunities um, for those listeners that are listening that are in leadership roles within organizations? What words of advice can you give to them to really carve their own path? I would say that it's really overcome your insecurities and your biases. I think understanding yourself, understanding what uh, strengths and or uh, contributions you bring to the table is very important. Within capital markets, I think most folks are aware it's very male dominated. Um, we have a very small percentage of women uh, in the organization. And that's not for lack of you know, the industry not wanting to have more women. I think a lot of that is we as women set limits on ourselves and we don't even go for those roles. And we think that it's, you know, beyond our uh, capabilities. And so we, we set those limits. And so I would say, stop setting limits on yourself. 
really reach for what you aspire to do, even if you don't have all of that experience and or maybe skill sets. Um, there are a lot of people that are willing to help and are willing to share their experiences and support you in uh, achieving those experiences and are advocating for those skill sets. So number one, don't limit yourself, like make sure that you truly go after your ambitions and be unapologetic about it. Mm, I love that. Be unapologetic and go for it. Ask, um, you know, I can imagine, have you ever been given a baton that just was like, come on, Victoria, take this. Here's an opportunity. Do you have an opportunity or a situation that you can think of where you were offered an opportunity that maybe you didn't think that you maybe had all um, the qualifications for, but still went ahead and did it anyways. Can you, were you, were you ever in that situation? Yes, for sure. I think I've had multiple experiences with that. I, I would say that I'm blessed with a wonderful network of uh, you know advocates and sponsors who've really challenged me to uh, disrupt myself. So there are times when, and I, I spent about 13 years in management consulting, where there isn't this you know, progression into the next role per se, but you really had to keep your network up in order to understand what was available out there uh, and really go after those roles that you, you wanted. There was a particular time when a, uh, one of my male sponsors said to me, well, why aren't you going for that uh, executive role? Like, what is it that's stopping you from doing that? Like, why are you only going thus far and, and not pushing further? And I had to kind of stop myself. I always thought that I was this big go-getter. And all of a sudden, this person was saying to me, why aren't you going for this role? Um, and I, I honestly had not thought about it. I really thought that I was not qualified, that I had no understanding of that line of business um, and that I was setting myself up for failure. Um, and when he said that to me, I thought, you know what, he was right. We have a number of transferable skills that we could leverage uh, across multiple business lines, multiple industries, I would even say. Um, and a lot of that requires the confidence and, and our belief in ourselves that we can acquire that skill when we don't have it. So sometimes it just needs or requires someone just to give you that little nudge for you to get that courage and, and branch out and disrupt yourself. Well, I think that's fantastic advice because like you said, the transferable skills are all industries. I tend to look at the lowest numbers as run ladies, run opportunity. Like I am a glass half full woman seeing those industries that have the low numbers are going ladies hey there's opportunity there right so I really love how you're such a great advocate for and you're leading by example to show that women yes you can do that you can achieve these things and you know just put yourself out there just a little bit and I would say though and especially for um, Asian women and, and women of visible minority most of us were not brought up to um, aspire to be the tallest tree. Like there is a saying that says, you know, like don't be the tall tree because it's, you, know, you will fall further. Um, and so overcoming some of our, um, you know, how we were brought up and, and uh, those values were you know, thrust upon us, not so much something that uh, we, we aspire for ourselves. Overcoming that sometimes is a, a larger challenge. Well, I think that leads really nicely into my next question, you know, um, amplify, why is it so important to recognize the achievements of women? I think it's so core, and this is why I'm really inspired by the work that you do, Monica, with this organization. I feel that if we're not amplifying voices of women, and if we're not uh, acknowledging the work and the accomplishments and the successes that we have, it doesn't lend a voice to the next generation of women and or all those other women around us where they're not able to see and so they're not able to be. Mm -hmm. And there are so few of us out there that it just makes it all the more important to make sure that we're standing up and amplifying so that the next person makes 
it makes it a little bit easier for the next person um, to recognize their own worth and maybe amplify and voice for someone else. And so we need to start this movement so that we can have equality, so that we can be more inclusive uh, in the future. Well, preach, preach, preach. I am completely on that same um, song sheet, but that is one of the biggest barriers that I see happening is um, people believe that by stepping into the spotlight, it's ego. And it's certainly not ego. It's knowing your worth, knowing your value and shining the light for others so that they can learn from you. Just like we're having this conversation today, learning some of your wisdom that you're able to really um, share with others. And they're like, okay, I, I think I can do that, right? If, if she can do it, I can do it. And I think that's what's really important. So yes, that's such an important piece, Victoria. So I'm really happy that you've drawn some light to that today because it's, you know, when we want to move those mountains and we want to encourage women in leadership roles, we have to learn from the ones that have done it before us. Absolutely. And I think for, you know, for most women, it's so difficult to stand up for yourself. Um, it's always easier. And I find that when I talk to a lot of women, it's so easy for them to stand up for the next person or the person beside them that they felt was maybe treated unjustly uh, and or if they felt they could help in some way, like no questions asked, they would help. But when they're asked to do that for themselves, they tend to shy away from it. And I think, uh, you know, it goes to, in some ways, how we're raised, um, how we define ourselves as women and how we identify as women that, uh, you know, inhibits us from being more bold uh, where we can be and, and standing up and, and being proud of our voices. Mm. So we do need to do that, do need to do more advocating for one another so that we can all be bold together. Then it doesn't feel so uncomfortable. And would you say, I, I guess my next question for you is, um, as you know, I am a very big support her, um, support her, of support her, which is to elevate the male champions that are, you know, advocating for women in their networks, their workplaces and their communities. So who have been some of your champions and support hers in your journey? And how important is that? It's extremely important. I would say that no one climbs the corporate ladder without a healthy network of supporters. And you've got to have, you know, uh, male supporters, uh, women supporters, um, you know, and advocates can be those that uh, work for you, those you work for, so it doesn't have to be position related. But I've been very fortunate uh, in that I do have some very strong male advocates uh, in the role that I'm in today. Again, it was a male um, mentor that really poked me in this direction to say, if you want to make a difference, and if you feel that your contributions will help modernize this bank, then you really need to focus and consider this position. And it wasn't an area that I had felt comfortable with. I had grown up in retail banking. I had done a number of stints in management consulting and mergers and acquisitions, but never in capital markets. So it's brand new. I had to learn things from scratch. The first thing I did was went in and said, listen, I don't understand this business as well as I would like. And so I will need a lot of mentors and sponsors to help me understand it. And I had a number of people just kind of ante up and say, ask me all of the questions you need. If you want to bounce ideas by me, make sure that you know we schedule meetings and, and uh, we'll have these conversations. And they were really safe spaces to have learning conversations. Um, that helped me build my confidence in the work that I do day to day and the decisions that I have to make day to day. So great networks. Amazing. And I, you know what I'm kind of picking up here that I think is super important to talk about is how if you don't know all the answers, you ask for the support, but the value that you're bringing to the conversation is sometimes when you're in a space of looking at an industry that has been working the same way without change for so many years, you're coming with a new perspective. 
Absolutely. And I would say that in, in, in any mentor mentee type relationship, I think both sides have a lot to gain. The mentor actually gains quite a bit. Like you say, it's really understanding the perception. But sometimes when you're so close to it, you don't see, you don't see through the trees. Um, but when you get a fresh pair of eyes or a different lens on something, mm -hmm. um, it makes it all the more, uh, you know, appealing or, or um, you know, worthwhile in exploring. And maybe those questions that should have been asked years ago needs to be asked again. Um, mm -hmm. Times have changed. Our environment is so very different than what it was five years ago, 10 years ago. In banking, some of this stuff is probably 30 to 40 years old. So you can just imagine, like we've evolved so much as um, a society. Uh, social media has lent itself into new ways of working that we wouldn't have imagined 10 years ago. And so fast forward, we need to ask those questions. We need to be curious and not be self-conscious in asking questions that we think, you know, are maybe stupid questions. They actually do need to be asked. And so we're, as you know, we're, you know, still in the middle of, well, not in the middle. I, I see a light at the end of the tunnel, but we have just experienced a historic moment as we navigate our ways through the global pandemic. Now, how did the pandemic really impact you and in your industry um, in this past year? And how did, how are you um, how did your leadership either change or evolve during this time? So lots of change. I think like everyone, this pandemic was, um, you know, uh, a catalyst for change that we wouldn't have seen in probably, you know, 18 months happened in three weeks. So we very quickly had to pivot and uh, went digital. So everything went digital first really still stayed focused on our clients, making sure that there was uh, confidence in the services and the products that we provided, but really tailoring to what the customer needed. So within the first three weeks of the pandemic, I would say all of our lines of businesses had to pivot to make sure that we could continue to service our clients digitally. We could uh, have products and services that enabled people to go about their own uh, lives, like or their everyday lives. So there was a lot of work uh, in around that. The work that I'm doing now in helping the bank transform and modernize their platforms is an testament to that. People work, uh, you know, differently. We've just launched a new uh, trade platform, and being that we're all sitting at home now, everyone has become a day trader from my teenage children to like people who never thought they needed a broker is now trading online, like the volumes have gone uh, just out the roof. So people are changing. And so as a bank and as any business, we need to change with our clients in, in order to uh, continue to bring value. Very interesting. And so I would love to know um, what female leaders inspire you um, you know, and what leadership qualities, you know, inspire you and other leaders that you're surrounded with? So it's hard to kind of pinpoint one female leader. I think throughout history, there's some very historical women that are trailblazers. And I find that women who uh, have embarked on male dominated um, industries, fascinating. Um, I find that women who are um, more servant leaders, like very supportive, like embracing the, uh, you know, team concepts, uh, that type of quality is, is what I, I look for, like the uh, authenticity uh, of the, the, the leader, uh, being courageous, being strong. There's just so many great examples, and yet... Uh, when you take a look at how many have actually made it into like the fortune uh, thousand or 500, there's so very few. Uh, and so we all start out the same, I think, from a gender uh, quality perspective in entry roles, probably 50-50. As we move up that corporate ladder, it becomes less and less. And then when you take a look at board roles, um, there's probably less than what, 6%? 
um, in the, the, the Fortune 1000 even. And then as uh, an Asian female, even smaller. So I really look for those around me that emulate those qualities that uh, I aspire to, uh, to emulate and are copy. Uh, and also women that have been trailblazers and are unapologetic about their ambitions. So uh, I think it's just, we, we do need to be more uh, role models for each other so that we can look across the board and say, look, there's a trait in our quality that I really aspire to emulate and emulate them. Mm. Well, I think that um, by conversations like we're having today, that enables those conversations to have um, more weight um, to raise others up alongside of us. Now, what are some of the things that you see as barriers for women to achieving those top senior executive roles um, that you could see opportunities for? I think some of our barriers are are like I said, uh, personal limitations. I think for a lot of women, we juggle a lot of things. When we start families, like I know when I started my family, I thought, you know what, uh oh, I'm going to have to drop out of this corporate race because I want to be the best mom that I can be. Um, instead of thinking, you know, my girlfriend always says she aspires to be the best dad that she can be, right? And, and it's one of these things where I think we set limitations on ourselves. We kind of pick and choose those things that we feel are important uh, to the detriment of something else. So I would say that we can embrace it all. And if your company or corporation is not making it easy for you to be that working mom, then challenge that status quo. I think we all need to have that uh, safe space, that equality in the workplace to do our best work in the times that we can do them in the way that benefits both the company and our families. And so we don't make those sacrifices. And so I think as women, it's that mentality of having to sacrifice something in order to achieve something else uh, is one of the biggest barriers. Mm. I think another barrier within the industry, it's really this um, notion that we have to emulate uh, male leadership characteristics to be successful. Um, and I don't feel that that is the case anymore. When we work in teams, it's not so much this authoritative figure standing up in front of a room, being very charismatic and, and speaking to uh, you know, uh, subordinates or being dictatorial. I think there's a time and place for those types of leadership traits, but it's no longer um, something that is a required uh, trait for us to be leaders in any industry. Mm. So well said. Um, and this is a great segue to, you know, my question to you is, you know, that work, work life balance question. How do you do it? How did you really keep your foot in the door, have your children rise to the top? What is your secret sauce? You know what, I've always been one of these uh, very energetic type people. So uh, even through high school, university, my uh, nickname was like the Energizer Bunny. Like I just go, go, go. And in every waking moment, I wanna make sure that that minute counts. Um, and so for my professional career, a lot of that is juggling uh, what I do uh, during the day, how I stay on top of either that market or that, uh, that industry by educating myself uh, or re-educating myself. When I started a family, it was ensuring that I included them in my plans. So I would say when I was traveling a lot as a management consultant, I would bring them with me. So that I wasn't, uh, you know, going to, uh, you know, I was living out of a suitcase anyways. And so I, I brought uh, my kids along, along with like either the nanny or my mother who would take care of them while I was in the office. But then at least we would have the evenings together or share a meal together. I felt that that was important to be, uh, to have that time with them on a regular basis. Uh, I also enjoy a lot of charity work. And so in the advocacy work and the charity work that I do, 
I always ensure that I include my family. So inviting them along to, to uh, listen either to me speak or participate in a charity event um, that helped me spend time with them, but also it gave me this really good uh, critic and uh, they would criticize uh, or, or give me feedback on my speeches and the events and how well it went, how well it didn't go. Uh, and so had a lot of support from that perspective, but it created that unity. So then there wasn't always this, you know, pull and tug on, am I spending enough time with uh, the family? Am I spending enough time focusing on my career? It just kind of became this mesh of, activities that was important to me and I was including others around me on that journey. Well that's inspiring to hear. I bet the kids loved being able to go to these hotels and having a pool. <laughs> they were so so spoiled like I would say both of them are saying they they now um, have been ruined forever uh, in, in uh, how they vacation so definitely. Well, I think that's a really great, you know, um, a way of, I mean, traveling right now, we all cannot wait to travel again, of course, you know, we're just waiting for the floodgates to open up so that we can travel safely back to those experiences again. But I hope that, you know, you sharing that experience can open up opportunities for, you know, women to think about how they can navigate through that, because I think it's really important to involve our kids into things that we do and, you know, they may, it may be the hardest struggle to get them to understand why you're doing it, but eventually I, I do believe that they'll understand um, and that role modeling that you can do for them is so important. So thank you for sharing. That was super exciting to hear that. Um, you know, as we come up on our end of our podcast today, I would just love to know, um, you know, like a little bit more about Victoria, like when you, you know, what do you do to get unstuck? you know, when you're not that energizer bunny, what kind of things do you really go back to as a ritual to get unstuck? Ooh, that's a great question. I think uh, depending on the mood, the times, I find that um, surrounding myself with people that give me energy really helps me get unstuck. Um, I'm by nature a fairly planful person. And so uh, before I go to bed every night, I actually make a list of things that I want to do the next day. And if it can't be accomplished in the next day, I give myself like a weekly list. That way, when I wake up in the morning, I know exactly what I need to accomplish that day. And then off we go. But when I get to a point where and now with COVID and being in lockdowns, I find that I'm in this, you know, groundhog day every day and it gets so very um, draining um, that I often will need to call a friend, someone that I know gives me energy and kind of bounce things back and forth just to kind of get myself out of that. So I think a lot of time it's uh, mindfulness, it's having that great network, it's having those people that you identify with so that you can draw energy from them uh, when you need it. And when they need it, you'll give that energy back. Um, but really it's be planful, make sure that, uh, you know, you start your day off with exactly what it is that you want to accomplish. And then you pivot along the way and, and make sure that, uh, you know, you, you stay abreast of what's going on and stay connected. And would there be one thing that you would do on a daily basis as a ritual that you would be like, this is my non-negotiable. What would that one thing be? <laughs> So by, I, I'm naturally a fairly introverted person. So I find that throughout the day, it's quite draining because I'm in meetings, I'm doing things like this. And before pre-COVID, I was like doing, uh, you know, engagements and, and speaking. So that one thing that I do every day is just really finding that 10 minute, 20 minute time to myself uh, where I can just you know, read something that is numbingly boring, uh, something I don't have to think about, and or just listen to my favorite song. Um, it's just that time to kind of recenter um, and just get back to my introverted self. Uh, and then once I'm done that, then, then I'm ready for the next thing. But I think it's that, that mindful moment. It just have to find that time to kind of reset. 
Well, I'm going to ask you a question about, you know, you shared that you're a little bit of an introvert and you speak and when you have the opportunities to speak. So for those, those that are listening that are, you know, nervous, speaking doesn't come natural to everybody. I mean, I know that once you get on that stage, if you're not nervous, just a little bit, then it doesn't mean that you're as passionate about it, but the nerves go away relatively soon. But how, how do you overcome you know, those opportunities where you're like speaking um, publicly when you're an introvert, because that's not a safe place for you, uh, a comfortable place. So how do you get over that? I think for me, it's really, I overcome it in thinking that what I'm doing is really trying to help someone else. And so when I get on the stage and when I talk about a certain topic, it's not about the me factor, it's about um, how I can help the other person. I've had a great career. I've had uh, great successes. And I would say a lot of it is through learning off the failures of others. And so if I could put that out there to help the next person, um, you know, it would be a win-win situation. So overcoming that fear, like as an introvert, I do a lot of prep. And so I spend some time thinking through the points I want to make, how I want to say certain things. And then when I get on that stage, I think I do have something that will help the next person. And so I need to get it out there so that it can help more than just one person. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's the drive that helps me overcome that introvertedness. Well, those are great strategies to use. And I'm sure that we used it today before the podcast. I said, just forget about all the millions of people that will be listening in. It's just about me and you. <laughs> That's right. And you paid my power song. So, oh, I did. I, <laughs> I love to have fun. Just saying. Yes. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so the, for the listeners, I always start with a power song and we dance it out um before we get started because I like to I, I really do believe in that energy as well like you talked about how it's raising the energy I mean we love to have draw people in you know get everybody excited and build that relationship right so anyways I like to do that with dance out to a, a power song so as we wrap up um you know I just want to ask you a couple more questions and you know, and, and this is really about you. So your leadership, right? What would you say is your best leadership quality um, that you have that you could really just say that, you know, that you're so most proud of? I think for me, it's that collaboration. Like I said before, I really aspire to work in teams. I find it very important. And there are days when you lead, there are days when you support. Um, and then there are days when you just need to be that fly on the wall. So what I'm most proud of is my ability to bring teams together to ensure that there is that collaboration um, and making sure that everyone is able to contribute in a way that they're most comfortable uh, to demonstrate their, their you know, best qualities. So that collaboration for me is, is something that I'm most proud of. Well, as a leader in a, an executive role, I think that's a really great way to lead by example. Um, and as we wrap up, it wouldn't be the Woman of Inspiration podcast without asking you what your definition of a woman of inspiration is to you. So definitely a woman of inspiration for me is a woman who aspires to be more and is unapologetic about her ambitions. So I mean, it just in saying those words, there's many of us who wish and, you know, want things, but to actually go after something that you want with all of, you know, yourself, uh, your passion and being unapologetic about it is, is what gets you to that next milestone. And as you hit those milestones, you create the new ones. Uh, and so it's just always, you know, aspiring to be more and, and, and to do more. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on our podcast today. And once again, we're super excited um, to have you as one of the 100 Women of Inspiration book contributors to share your leadership, um, you know, insights and wisdom. And I, you know, really love how you've shared so 
authentically about some of the things that women need to do to help and support and to get into those leadership roles or to manage through their relationships and, and raise their kids while trying to work at the same time. It's so important. We can all relate to that. So I want to say thank you so much for being a part of the Woman of Inspiration podcast. Um, for those that are listening that would love to learn a little bit more about you, of course, we have the Woman of Inspiration book coming out in the fall and the road show across Canada. But how can they get a hold of you, Victoria? So best way probably is to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I do meet a number of folks there, a lot of people looking for some career advice. Um, being that we're in Asian Heritage Month, again, lots of reach out from that perspective, because unfortunately, we don't see uh, enough uh, Asian female leaders uh, in the corporate workspace. And so best way is to, uh, to get me on LinkedIn, and uh, I'll make sure we connect. Wonderful. And just to know that you can get to her inbox, just say, I heard your Woman of Inspiration podcast. And then that's a quick little accept right away. So just a little extra ways of flagging it. Um, just, you know, let Victoria know that you heard the podcast and wanted to chat with her. Um, again, thank you for your words of wisdom. Anything else that you'd love to leave our listeners with today um, as we close up and wrap up our Woman of Inspiration podcast? Yeah, no, for sure. So thank you again for taking the time. I think it's so very important that we make the time to share our individual stories. Every woman out there has one. Uh, take some time to either write yourself down, yours down, uh, you know, put your thoughts down on paper, tell someone about your story. It will go far and it will help someone, um, you know, find their voice as well. So we do need to do better at advocating for one another and supporting one another. Uh, absolutely make sure that you take that action. Uh, if you haven't advocated for someone today, do one, do three, but at least, uh, you know, make sure that you're, you're reaching out to, to help another woman uh, within your networks or within your community. Well, thank you for that because we do need more cheerleaders and, you know, congratulations on all of your successes, um, Victoria, and super excited to have you part of this great journey that we're on together. Um, and, you know, for those listeners, um, thank you for joining today. We ask that if you loved this podcast, that you really do share the information with those in your network that really could use the words of wisdom, um, the relatable stories, the authentic stories that we're sharing and and for sure have the opportunity to meet Victoria. Um, and it's been a treat. So thanks everyone for joining us on the Woman of Inspiration podcast. And once again, thank you, Victoria, for joining us today. Thank you.